Okay, everybody, and welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Growth Stock Mentor. I'm Justin Nielsen, your host, and it is Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. And as always, I have Arusha Paris, Portfolio Manager at O'Neill Global Advisors, joining me today. And returning back to the show, we have John Najarian. So he is the co-founder of Market Rebellion. A lot of you will probably recognize him as a frequent contributor on CNBC. Uh, so welcome back to the show, John. Great to be with you. Thank you, Justin. Arusha, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, Definitely. great to have you back as well, especially with the market that we've had lately, a lot of increased volatility. And I know that as an option trader, uh, option specialist, I should say, um, we're really excited to kind of get your take on some of the things that you can do to take advantage of this extra volatility and, and you know find a way to make money in a market where uh, a lot of people are maybe taking more hits than they'd like. So we'll cover that in the second segment. Um, and of course, we'll talk a lot about some of the the stocks that you're looking at and some of the trades with options. Um, but first, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the market. And uh, why don't we go ahead and just start with the NASDAQ composite um, just to kind of get a general sense. I mean, you know, we were up 1.8% today at one point. Uh, that is not how we finished. Uh, we were down 1.8%. So, uh, John, could you maybe give us your take on uh, the, the market and how this change in character has unfolded? Yeah. Um... Obviously, uh, ever since Friday, when we first heard of Omicron, uh, the, the new variant out of South Africa, or at least first detected in South Africa, um, we knew that there would be some problems. Um, we didn't know how bad it was. Uh, obviously, after the weekend, we got a lot of talk that, uh, and you know, talk from people who are boots on the ground in South Africa that said that it's relatively mild people that are coming down with Omicron uh, variant are, uh, for the most part, not filling up the hospitals, um, not nearly as bad as Delta. And uh, so, of course, the market had a pretty significant lift. Um, and then we've had a couple of days here where uh, the market has said, wait a minute, maybe we came back too fast. <laughs> and they hit the market again. And uh, you know, I, I think my friend Jim Cramer said it best, maybe, when he said, just watch the first case in the United States, because up until today, December 1st, we hadn't had a case declared in the United States. He said, as soon as we have the, sec the first case, the second shoe will drop. And that second shoe did drop today. Um, that erased all those gains that you talked about, took us back to uh, uh, break even on the day. And then reversed further as we, uh, you know, more of the folks on the West Coast got that dissemination of, uh, you know, what the impact was to the markets and a 500 point rally in the Dow gone. Uh, so I think a lot of people mistakenly probably sold on that. And I say mistakenly, Justin, because if indeed the variant is what we think it is, um, then I think this is overdone. But nonetheless, because of what we were seeing in volatility, and uh, I've said it before, but volatility, volume, um, and velocity are what I really care about a lot in the stock market. And we had all three today. It yeah. was a very fast turnaround. Um, that's the velocity side, the volatility. We popped all the way to 32 and a half uh, before settling at a little over 31. Those the are big numbers versus mm -hmm. a week ago. And volume very big today, not a light volume day. All right. Yeah. So, so now with the NASDAQ, we're, we're right back to the 50 day moving average. Uh, we're starting to collect some distribution days. Now, John, the, the comments from, uh, from Chairman Powell, Fed Chairman Powell, didn't help either no. by telling <laughs> everyone, maybe we should remove the transitory, you know, let's get rid of that and we'll just keep the inflation. Yeah, that, you're absolutely right. Um, this hasn't been 100% on this new variant. Right. Uh, the, the new variant <laughs> uh, in the uh, seat as chairman is not new to the Fed, but certainly his observation uh, and dropping that term transitory um, was new. We didn't know if he would do that right away or sort of ease into that, Arusha, mm -hmm. but the fact that he just came straight out and said, you know what? We're taking transitory out. It isn't transitory. 
So the question will be um, how fast do they uh, do this taper? And then the next question will be, um, are they able to actually raise rates right. after they're right. done tapering? Right. And the, all of that uncertainty thrown at a time when we're seeing a fair amount of uh, uh, uncertainty and disruption in the markets from the variant. Um, that was a witch's brew that, you know, the bears loved, but the bulls hated. Right. Well, and what's strange to me is even before this variant news came out on Friday, um, we already had a situation where there was really uh, maybe some weakness underneath the surface that was being masked by the indexes. Um, you know, we've, we've been talking with a lot of folks about the lack of breadth and how, how many stocks were actually trading below their 50-day moving average lines, trading below their 200-day moving average lines. And um, if we just go ahead and real quickly show for those that are watching the video, maybe GMIAB which shows the NASDAQ advanced decline line, um, that was, uh, you know, that was in a pretty solid downtrend before uh, the, this variant news came out. So is, is that something that you think kind of played into this or was it just, it was already weak and this just the variant news kind of made thing and Powell just made it, made it weaker. When, when we're watching and listening to those earnings reports, and company after company was beating again this quarter. Right. Um, but um, combination of either A, uncertainty, or B, um, very uh, 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 pessimistic guidance, I'd say. Um, obviously, all CEOs would like to lower the bar and be able to just step over it rather than have to jump up over that bar that they set for themselves, with very few exceptions. Elon Musk is one of the few exceptions to that rule. He doesn't mind putting the pressure on himself and his engineers and the workers on the factory line. He doesn't mind doing that. But most CEOs are not big on making it tougher on themselves. They're big on saying, well, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and supply chain issues and, you know, uh, uncertainty about variants and lockdowns and, you know, all That's they true. throw, you know, the kitchen sink at it. So right. that the next quarter, they can look like a hero. Um, I think uh, the fact that, like you say, the advanced declines uh, picked up so dramatically to the downside, uh, the decliners, that is, and the fact that the earnings were good, and yet they were sold almost mm -hmm. across the board. I mean, again, we don't need to look further than today. Um, yeah. We had unusual activity in um, Salesforce yesterday. Mm -hmm. just the day before the earnings, and they weren't just buying uh, earnings-related puts. Um, an earnings-related put, guys, as you and your listeners would know, is something that's the same week. So in other words, they could have been buying a, a Salesforce or a CRM put for this week. They didn't. Right. They bought them out there into January, um, those 280 puts, and it was trading at about 287, CRM was which was already down $13 from where I was able to sell it just, you know, a few hours before that, you know, maybe it was 24 hours, but, you know, we were up around 298, couldn't hold it, pushed all the way down to the 280s. And then they came out with a fabulous earnings report. I mean, it was really good, solid earnings across the board and they slammed it. Um, and it was down, uh, let me see, 6% or about $16 in the post last night, they'd be happy to only finish this <laughs> right. because yeah, they it's looking good now, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they sent another 10 bucks to the downside during the day today. So um, I think there's a lot to be said about the technical that you just pulled up about that advanced decline and how many stocks had actually been reacting negatively to good news. And, you know, we all know that old expression, if you um, see bad reaction to good news, um, you're more or less in a bearish trend, if not a bear market. If you see a uh, good reaction to bearish news, then you know the bulls don't care. It's just like, oh, we're off to the races every day. We're going to go higher. Mm -hmm. um, it's been very uh, uh, a thinner and thinner group on top that are able to put up gains. And if it weren't for Apple this week, mm -hmm. um, I think we yeah. would have really struggled even more. 
-hmm. Now, now, John, so what, one thing that we do here at IBD is when we're looking at a lot of these stocks, we're seeing, are they holding support areas? Are they breaking? And so really over the last couple of weeks, you're just kind of noticing one group after another starting to break, sell pretty hard, sell off pretty hard, kind of like the Salesforce. Have you started seeing that? And you mentioned Salesforce with the unusual options activity. Did you start to notice, wow, there's a lot more puts, a lot more people buying out longer term puts for a lot of different types of stocks that were doing well? Did you start seeing that kind of cascade over the last couple of weeks? Um, we have. And primarily in those Kathy Wood-ish yeah. or at least the high yeah. PE stocks, um, mm -hmm. some that don't even have, of course, uh, much in the way of earnings. Um, so it's tough to put a PE on those stocks, yeah. um, but um, we've seen that happening. And um, some friends of mine launched a uh, something called the SARC, which is the short arc ETF. Oh, right. Wow. Um, wow. And it's not that they don't think Kathy's smart, and I'm certainly not smashing Kathy Woods. Um, she ha she has earned the accolades that she's got, but um, in many cases she's early. Um, or she overstays her welcome in some cases. Obviously, no one who's been on the ride with her in Tesla thought that she overstayed that ride. Right. Um, right. But uh, nonetheless, uh, this SARK, S-A-R-K, is the uh, Innovation Shares short um, contract for uh, Kathy Woodstocks. And all it is, it's the simplest ETF you could have imagined. Uh, my friend Mark Tuttle put it, or Matt Tuttle rather, put it together. All it does is short the arc. Wow. Um, that's it. It doesn't short the stocks. It just is a direct reverse of the arc. And some people listening might say, well, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just sell the arc? Well, a lot of people can't have a short in their um, IRAs, right. in their 401ks and so forth. But you can have a negative ETF. Mm -hmm. um, and so this ETF, Exchange Traded Fund, since it only sells the ARC, um, basically can be in people's um, IRAs and so forth. And people can also use it as a hedge. And even though it's only been around for a few days in the month of November, I think it came out the 8th or 9th of November, um, it's already up pretty substantially. Yeah, yeah. And that, like a high tight flag. <laughs> yeah, it, it speaks directly to what you guys were talking about though. You know, that underlying the market, there are a lot of stocks that are not performing. So every day when you come home after hearing, boy, another record day in the NASDAQ, and then you look at your stocks and you go, how do I pick these losers <laughs> if my stocks are always yeah. down? Yeah. Um, and it, it, you wouldn't be alone in that because that's been happening to more and more people because it's getting thinner and thinner at the top. Well, and to that end, uh, if we just kind of wrap this up with a, a final look at the Russell 2000, so the small cap, index. And we could just go ahead and look at IWM, which is the iShares Russell 2000 ETF. That kind of seemed like it was rolling over a little bit earlier. And you know now we're down 12.8% from the top. So arguably, this is already an intermediate correction in the Russell. Is, is that playing into your uh, thesis at all on what's happening you with bet. the market? Um, so last week, we had several bearish put spreads go off in this particular index in the IWM. Mm -hmm. um, and they, these aren't small trades. I mean, so for instance, they were buying the end of November, um, 236 puts, um, they were buying, which is the November 29th, uh, 236 puts, um, they were buying just, uh, yesterday, uh, they bought 17,000 of the January 206 puts that was with the index yesterday at 216. Wow. So as you guys see from that chart, um, we've been breaking down from those levels and whether it's a hedge or whether it's um, a straight out short bet, um, I don't really care. When they're accumulating fast, that's the, what I want to follow. Like I said, volume, volatility, and velocity. And all three of those were met with these. Okay. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a look at uh, some of the things that John is trading right now and how he's handling this extra volatility in the market. So make sure you stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Bill O'Neill, founder of IBD and a legend in the world of growth stock investing, mentored Jim Ropel, and it changed Jim's life. Now, Jim is here to mentor you. Take your free trial on growthstockmentor.com. Every week, 
you'll get Jim's thoughts on the market, his ride the wave plan, Jim's favorite true market leaders, two updates each week, and a live members only meeting once a month. Also, you can ask Jim anything, anytime, 24 seven. Take your free trial on growthstockmentor.com now. Okay, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Growth Stock Mentor. Uh, it's Justin Nielsen here, along with Arusha Paris and our special guest, John Nigerian from Market Rebellion. He's a co-founder over there and CNBC contributor. So, John, um, you know, a lot of stuff been going on in the markets. Uh, how do you take advantage of this? Uh, I know you you focus a lot on options. I mean, that's what Market Rebellion is all about. And so, um, mm-hmm. of course, people can find that at marketrebellion.com. Um, Thank you. What, what is it that you're doing uh, for your your positioning? Well, um, the uh, higher volatility, um, Justin, certainly makes certain strategies a lot more uh, attractive. Um, they're the same viability as they'd be with lower volatility, but with the higher volatility, you can frequently get into spreads at cheaper prices. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because if you're doing spreads, um, in some cases, you're ratioing options like in a butterfly spread, um, where, for instance, you might buy, um, you, we were just talking about the IWM. If I were bullish on the IWM, which was about 213 or so today, um, I would like to be in probably the um, 212 calls one time, then short two of the 216 calls. And so the differential between those two strikes would be $4, Mm -hmm. 212 to 216, which would mean then that I buy one again at at the 220 strike. So I have one at the bottom, one at the top, and I'm short right in the middle. That becomes the body of that butterfly. So it's one by two by one. And um, during times of high volatility, frequently I can put on positions like that with a bias, with an upside bias, slight upside bias, Mm -hmm. um, and put it on for almost nothing. Um, When volatilities are low, I generally have to pay a lot more for that spread. So for instance, maybe I'm able to put it on for 12 or 20 cents when volatility is high um, with the possibility of it going to $4, uh, the differential between the strikes, um, if it finished right at 216 and those calls all went out worthless um, and I have the protection above at 220 just in case. So uh, you can only lose what you pay for a butterfly spread. And on the other hand, um, if the volatility is lower, frequently I'd have to pay 50 or 60 cents for that exact same spread um, just because of the volatility and how it's skewed. You can do that to the downside or the upside. And depending on my outlook for that, either short term, you know, days or week or longer term, like a month, that's long term for me. Um, <laughs> I can do that with spreads like that condors, butterflies, iron butterflies. Any of those kinds of spreads really um, frequently we get better pricing um, during times of high volatility, probably because people are afraid and right. things get mispriced when people are afraid. Mm-hmm. Now, John, one, one thing that I, I like about options, especially using kind of credit spreads or butterflies, is that there's risk management built in. You know exactly right. how much you're going to lose. Yep. And you know, that's the name of the game, right? If you can manage your risk, you always have a chance uh, as long as those, those losses don't get too big. Uh, let's, we, we were talking about ye- yesterday. Uh, let's, let's walk through an example of, of, with a stock with PayPal, where PayPal uh, has been selling off, has been in trouble, but this has started to look a little bit more attractive to you as, as um, maybe a longer term buy, or at least as an options trade. Can you walk us through how you would handle something that's been selling off quite a bit? Yeah, um, I, I would love to see it continue to consolidate here at about the 182 level or thereabouts, you know, call it a dollar, $180, $182, right around there, Arusha. Okay. Um, because then when you look back on those charts, you know, you're talking about basically November of last year, you know, you're getting in at that kind of level um, for uh, what I think is one of the better, um, if not best, I think the best is actually square in this space. But I think this one um, versus square 
presents some great opportunities. So a lot of my co uh, my friends on CNBC were all bulled up after the earnings because the earnings came out, they blew it out. They had some very good news about Venmo uh, in 2022 being part of the Amazon platform payment network, which is great for Venmo. And that's of course a division of PayPal. Um, and the stock popped to over 230 in the post market that day. Wow. So I'm not sure if your charts pick up the after hours movement, no. but it no. did hit 230 in the after hours. And then they started to lay out the case for why it was going to be a tough quarter or maybe a couple oh. quarters coming up. Brutal. And it just fell and fell back to by the time we opened the next day, it might have been 200 yep. or something like that. And on the show, a bunch of my uh, co-panelists were uh, saying how much they love buying it there. And I said, you know, there are rarely these one day events. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be first. Um, and I'm going to be a little more patient. And they were all buying at 205 up to 210. And I held off until yesterday when I started buying at 180. Uh, I bought my first tranche at 186, the next at 182 um, yesterday. And I immediately was loading big, fat, pumped up options into it because as the stock sold off, those options, just like CRM options today, um, post earnings are very fat. Uh, and the reason they're fat is just experienced a very large drop. Mm -hmm. So um, putting those options against what, our, what the stock that I was buying bought me a fair amount of downside protection, Arusha. Okay. And that's what I really liked uh, yesterday. And so one of the trades I put on was that butterfly like that, where even though I was buying some stock and selling calls against the stock, I was also putting on the 180, 190, 200 butterfly out in um, January, um, playing for um, a, a little move to the upside, not huge. If it went, if it migrated back to 190, um, I, you know, hit, hit a home run um, mm -hmm. because of course that's where those two calls are sold. And I own one call at the 180 and one call at the 200 um, and short two of them at that 190. So that's one of the ways that I would play that because I have a very low risk like you said, I know exactly how much I could lose and you're exactly right. That's the best thing to focus on. Not how much can I make? Well, I can right. make $10. I'm going to put this on. Yeah. No, yeah. you should always focus on how much can I lose because that possibility exists where none of us are right all the time. Um, I, I boast to my brother and our team that our stuff is probably about 78% right. Um, and I believe it really is that, but that then it's a question of risk management for yep. that 22% that I'm going to be wrong on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's incredible. So um, that, that was going to be kind of the next question I had, you know, what kind of probabilities you have, because usually when you've got low risk and the high reward, that's usually a low probability trade. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the probabilities um, it, with, with, with some of these trades that you're talking about when you have that, uh, I guess, sometimes the mismatch in pricing that's going on, or uh, are there other factors that are kind of making this um, probability a little bit more in your favor? Well, I think um, a lot of people uh, do think that PayPal is a good company, strong company, um, but uh, there's going to be, and there probably is already, uh, a lot of tax loss selling involved, guys. And the dirty little secret is you don't have to wait till the end of the year to do it. Um, if you've got your tax loss in there right now, um, one of the things that many of us do is that we sell um, basically before Thanksgiving. Why? Because I, I have to avoid the wash sale rule, mm -hmm. which means for 30 days, I can't buy back in. I can't have a long position in PayPal if I exit today and still recognize that loss. You can buy back in whenever you want, but you won't be able to recognize the loss because of that so-called wash sale rule. Mm -hmm. So because of that, and that's something the IRS pays a lot of attention to, yeah. um, a lot of us, uh, luckily I didn't own this one and haven't incurred that big loss, but for all the people who were in there in the 230, 240, 260 range, and now it's 
80 bucks lower than that, they're probably looking to harvest some of that against gains they've got. That's, I think, some of the additional selling that's going on right now, Justin. So um, you don't have to, if I really wanted to move the odds into my favor and said, maybe it consolidates for a month, if that was the case, um, then one of the best trades would be to be short two of the at the monies, two of the 180s, and maybe be in the 175, um, 185, long both of those calls and short the 180s, because then all you wanted to do is sit there. Um, if it sits there, you make money, and the highest odds during a short period of time are that it does that, that it consolidates here. But I'm thinking that a lot of the sell pressure that came over the last week or 10 days came from people recognizing losses um, so that they could get back into it before year end and be in the position again for January. But they can't do that if they wait till December 29th or 30th to sell. Now, John, um, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's tons of volume coming into this w when it's so selling, selling off. So it, it could definitely be that. Now, for those who have, you know, maybe ha held it, bought it, say bought it at 300, and now they wrote, wrote it all the way down to 180. They haven't done any of these kind of option strategies on it. They actually have the stock. Are there ways with options to kind of repair that? trade or try to generate some income while they hold on to those shares? Absolutely. And uh, I was talking with Justin just a little bit earlier about that, that one of your authors was talking about that. And I think that that is a prudent trade for somebody that, you know, unfortunately has that big loss, but mm -hmm. doesn't want to take it and instead wants to try to get towards break even. With that big a loss, you know, from 280 or 300, you're not going to get that. That's going to take a long time. Yeah. But um, if, for instance, you were able to be in the January um, at the money, the 180s, and short two of the 190s, um, you could, it, that position against your long stock would act like you own two um, or 2x of the position instead of just one. So if it was a 1,000 share trade mm -hmm. um, and that you owned it from say 270 um, and now it's 180, you could be in the 180 calls 10 times and short two of the 190s. Again, that's going to give you double the performance between those strikes, 180 and 190. And then it's going to get called out or you're going to have to roll if it goes into the money beyond 190. Um, but it'll act like you own 2,000 shares instead of one because you own 1,000 shares. And then the second 1,000 shares comes from that 10 lot yeah. of then $10 in the money calls. So you'd recover um, $20,000 of your loss on a move back to 190. Um, and again, if you are in from 270 down to 180, your loss is greater than that, but right, it right. eats into that, but you'd have to do it several times okay. to get that kind of money back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just to get back to the original point of the risk management part, um, what, what kind of extra risk does that put on for you, uh, pu putting something out like that on? No extra risk. Right. Um, if you already own the stock yeah. and you're comfortable owning the stock and knowing that the stock could still go lower, um, that's the caveat. Yep. The, you have additional the, stock risk, risk. Mm -hmm. yep, the additional risk, you assumed none yeah. because 10 of those calls are against 10 of those 190s and then the other 10 uh, 190s are against your stock. So you're one to one. You haven't um, exploded your risk profile at all. And in most cases, um, your brokerage firm will let you do that even in your IRA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what you're giving up in that case is if it goes up significantly above, you know, your, your 190 or what, what have you, yep. then you're not going to be participating, but it's, again, it's going to let you get back to that break even a lot quicker. So one, one right. other question that I had for you, John, is, um, you know, you, you have a lot of these really interesting option trades and, and everything, but you also have some stock trades. What kind of percentage, um, you know, because a lot of times people talk about uh, you want to limit your option exposure because they're more volatile and uh, everything. So what, what kind of exposure do you have to options versus stocks? What, what's your combination? Mine is probably 80-20, 80% options, 20% stocks. Mm -hmm. um, 
in that equity portfolio. I have other investments, but in the equities that I'm trading, I'm 80% in options and only 20% in stocks. And the few stocks that I own, when you see my disclosures, for instance, either on our website, Market Rebellion, or on CNBC, um, they publish what my holdings are every right. time I'm on. And I'd say I probably have six or seven stocks versus maybe as many as 30 option positions. Wow. So it's similar sort of a ratio there too. Mm -hmm. Great. And so uh, for people that want to learn a little bit more about, you know, some of these are, you know, some pretty sophisticated strategies. Uh, they do require some math, some understanding of how the options market work. Uh, wh what would you suggest for people to take a look at? Of course, there's the website marketrebellion.com, but you also, uh, are you posting some of these trades on Twitter as well? Or We do. Mm -hmm. um, we post some of those trades and I try to outline them in my daily, you know, I call it three at three, which is a uh, something that I do every business day. We put out a, a video that's probably 12 or 15 minutes long about strategies that we're doing that day um, in unusual option activity that we're following. Um, so yeah, my, my Twitter account at J-O-N-N-A-J-A-R-I-A-N would be a good one um, to follow. Okay, when we get back, uh, we're going to go over some more trades with John, uh, talk a little bit more about some of the stocks or option trades that he's interested in. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Bill O'Neill, founder of IBD and a legend in the world of growth stock investing, mentored Jim Ropel, and it changed Jim's life. Now, Jim is here to mentor you. Take your free trial on growthstockmentor.com. Every week, you'll get Jim's thoughts on the market, his ride the wave plan, Jim's favorite true market leaders, two updates each week, and a live members-only meeting once a month. Also, you can ask Jim anything, anytime, 24-7. Take your free trial on growthstockmentor.com now. Okay, welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Growth Stock Mentor. It's Justin Nielsen, along with Arusha Pires, and our special guest, John Nigerian, uh, co-founder of Market Rebellion. So, John, uh, we already went through some uh, real interesting trades. Uh, I mean, a nice detail on PayPal. Um, you got any other stocks uh, slash option trades that are on your radar right now? Yeah, I could do a bunch in the uh, um, infrastructure play uh, mm -hmm. area, but the one you see on the screen right here, Albamare uh, or A. Uh, ALB <laughs> is a, a little bit easier. <laughs> because Maybe it's Albamare, maybe it's Albamare. Uh, yeah, the way we've been pronouncing it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if it was Nigerian, everybody'd get it wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, guys, is a great lithium play. Yeah. It's the biggest, I believe, by market cap um, and one of the largest production. Uh, but production alone um, won't get it done because they can't produce as much lithium and cobalt and nickel as the world needs. Because again, it's not just the United States, but uh, Joe Biden, the president, um, wants to get 500,000 charging stations across the country uh, so that we can start weaning off of uh, fossil fuel. Um, one of the ways we do that um, is either hydrogen, which like 2% of these car companies are focused on. I mm -hmm. think it's only Toyota maybe that's focused on that. Um, the rest of them are all uh, lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. And this stock benefits from that like very few others. Um, it's a big uh, cap stock. It's not small cap. Um, it's got huge potential because of what I described. Look at that movement, you know, over the last year or so. When, when you see a chart that goes lower left to upper right like that, that's pretty nice uh, performance. There are a couple other smaller ones like Lithium America, LAC, right. um, and a real small one that I'm actually on the board of uh, that's uh, ABML, um, American Battery Tech. That's You'll hear a lot more about that one this next year, ABML. But right now, uh, we're just waiting for them to uh, basically start uh, selling and uh, putting out as much. They're a lithium recycler. Mm -hmm. So right now, you, you guys probably know this, but if you have a battery that you want to replace in your car, 
you have to bring it in. It's so-called core charge, not because um, it has much value, but because it does a lot of damage if it goes into the ground. Right. You know, you put that in with waste um, and it goes into the ground and that lead and all the rest of it seeps into the ground. It's not good. Mm -hmm. So instead, they uh, pay uh, companies to recycle. That's why they give you five or 10 bucks off on that core charge for your battery. Now, that's a regular um, acid and lead battery that, mm -hmm. that starts most of our vehicles now. Um, a lithium battery is everything from your iPhone or Samsung or any of your phones um, to, for instance, use Tesla batteries. Right. And there's a couple ways you can uh, recycle that. One is the way the Chinese do it. Um, and the Chinese are great at doing things at scale, but they're not great about how they affect the environment. Um, and so what they do is they basically superheat all this, uh, you know, lithium in a plastic casing or whatever rubberized casing, and all of that crap goes up the Ooh. chimney and then hits the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then they end up with a pile of lithium and cobalt and so forth that they can recycle. That's the dirtiest way to recycle. These guys um, uh, that recycle in America don't do it that way. That's why I'm so bullish on American battery tech. That's why I like Lithium America and Albamar is the biggest, but they're not a recycler. They are one that just takes it out of the ground and turns it into a usable thing for um, the gigafactory that Tesla has in Nevada. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, walk through a little bit uh, maybe of how you would trade this. So um, right now, okay, so the market's pretty volatile. Uh, is it something that you uh, take advantage of maybe a little weakness here to, to get into it? Or is this something um, where you're going to be waiting, being a little bit more patient? Uh, how, how would you handle this right now? Um, I, I think on any dips like this, you could put on some spreads um, in this stock. Again, I'm because it's a $300 stock, nearly, you know, whatever, $260 stock, 1,000 shares is as much as a condo. So, you know, $260,000, I know that doesn't buy a condo where you live right. or where you live, Justin, but um, what I'm looking for is to put a lot less money on the table um, for that investment. So I'd be putting on something more like um, a, uh, uh, an at-the-money call spread buying the 260s, selling the 270s, one-to-one, -one, not a ratio, right. and uh, participating that way, creating a synthetic law. Mm -hmm. John, for, say, say you did that synthetic spread right there. And after, as it was coming close to expiration, you wanted to maybe convert it to holding actual stock and try to hold it for a little bit longer term trend or something. Could you do that out of that spread that, that you initiated? Sure. Especially if that one leg, our long leg, is in the money. Mm -hmm. um, we could just buy back the short leg, um, hold that. If it, if it went in the money, the short leg and the long leg, if they're both in the money, um, then, of course, I'm buying that short leg back either at what I paid for it or at a loss. If mm -hmm. it's a loss, I'd match that up against gains that I take later on elsewhere in the portfolio or in this stock. Um, but again, if all of a sudden a rich uncle died and you have enough money to hold a $260,000 stock, uh, then by all means, pull off that short call and now just start loading in or selling upside calls against your stock. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of related to the whole EV market and lithium uh, plays, uh, we were also talking a little bit about Lucid. Now, Lucid, of course, you know, this was a special purpose acquisition company, a SPAC. Um, and, you know, once once it de-SPAC'd, it really, uh, really <laughs> kind of took off uh, here. Uh, we, we've seen some really strong gains. And again, this is this is before they were really going into production. You know, they were just kind of starting out. Um, you know, a lot of these EV makers that are just starting out, Rivian, uh, uh, IPO there that's that's been on fire. So uh, talk to me a little bit about Lucid and why this is one that uh, is on your radar. All right. Well, um, they make a, a great product from what I've seen and heard. I haven't driven one or sat in one, which, you know, I'm lucky enough to have, I don't own a Tesla, but I've ridden in a lot. 
and mm -hmm. I like them. I, I really like what I've seen in, uh, in this one. And that initial uh, on the D spec this year, when it went from nine bucks or 960, whatever, you know, because all specs come out at 10 and then they usually are just under there until they find the acquisition. Mm -hmm. Churchill went out, bought these guys, changed the name and it was off to the races. So, you know, three months later, it's a $65 stock. That's tremendous performance, but then it sells off with everything else um, in that March, uh, April, May timeframe. But now it's been building back up towards that same high and doing it on much bigger volume. Um, so I like that. And I certainly like that they're a high-end manufacturer of um, uh, an EV. So they're gonna qualify for all the same credits that Tesla does. Um, Right now, Biden is proposing a $12,000 additional credit if you buy your EV from a union factory. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, though, the only ones that are union are Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford um, in our country, uh, perhaps overseas, but I don't think this applies to those, um, Volkswagen and so forth, Mercedes, Porsche. But I think this one um, is in good position to really make some money for shareholders. And like Albemar, I would be buying this one on dips. So, so yeah, so when you see a, a stock and merged out this couple of handle, ran up 100%, at this point, you're just putting on your watch list, you're waiting. How far or how, how big of a pullback are, are you going to, do you generally look for before it's like, okay, now let me put my strategy in place? Well, I've been in this one, um, luckily, since about 17 on okay. this recent move. And I've just been in calls and rolling up call spreads, Very Arusha. Nice. Yeah. So right now, um, my last batch of call spreads didn't work out so well, because as you can see, it came back down from, you know, the whatever, 57 or so right. down to right. 51. Yep. It's not over yet, but... Um, we don't need any more days like today where, you know, the market reverses so dramatically. Yeah. And on any day where we're stable, given what I think the potential is, I think, uh, you know, on five and seven dollar pullbacks like this one, that's the time that I want to roll down to a better call spread, which I was doing today. So instead of being in the 5560 um, in December, now I'm out in January in that 50. Uh, 60 spread. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what, I think we have time for uh, maybe one more idea. And certainly one of the things that kind of caught my eye in terms of strength uh, and things that are holding up is in the semiconductor space. Uh, so of course, two big ones, uh, AMD, NVIDIA, um, either of those appeal to you? Both of them do. Mm -hmm. um, and NVIDIA is probably the uh, one to buy of those two, only because of all the um, all the chatter about the metaverse. Right. If you really want to participate with an uh, augmented reality headset, um, art of, whether it's artificial reality, augmented reality, or um, if you just want to basically have a computer that's running fast in that metaverse so that it feels more real, um, you need um, those grass, graphic processing units, GPUs that NVIDIA makes. Mm -hmm. um, they are the recognized leader in that space. And so you're not only getting mining because they're a big part of Bitcoin mining. Mm -hmm. The miners love buying those NVIDIA chips for that. But you're also getting uh, computing power, CAD CAM and all that, as well as the metaverse. Um, so I think you have a lot of levers that they can pull. And on top of everything else, there's more demand than supply we started talking at the top of the show about supply and demand drives right. prices. Right. Well, these guys have more demand than they have supply. So that's a, that's a happy problem, at least in the short term. Yeah. And in the, in the, well, now this has gone on a pretty big run from the consolidation that it, that it emerged out of. Um, so this is probably another one that add to the watches right now, wait for a pullback, let it settle down and then put whatever strategy that appeals to you. Yes. Exactly. And um, I, I am a true believer. I own both stocks, AMD and NVIDIA. But um, like I say, the reason for NVIDIA being slightly favored is beyond the 
data centers that uh, AMD makes the bulk of their profits from, NVIDIA has more levers to pull. Um, and I would, uh, you know, it, it's a happy problem, but they haven't hardly had any pullbacks lately. That's true. And, and what kind of uh, option trade um, are you kind of basically the same thing? Are you looking at, at spreads on this? Are you uh, waiting a little bit or, and I should disclose yep. that I have a, a stock position in this myself, but um, you know, so how, how are you, how are you? So he's one of those guys, Justin is with the uh, condo and a half or two condos <laughs> right. deep into this one, because again, a thousand shares is right. $300,000. Right. Now, obviously this in the past year, you could have bought stock at 125 mm -hmm. um, and now it's 315. Um, so that's a happy problem, but it was a six figure investment at $125 a share. It's 125,000. Now it's 300. Um, I am definitely a call spreader in this one. I haven't owned shares since it topped 200. Do I wish I did? And I was in Justin's position, of course, <laughs> um, but I'm in call spreads and I just keep rolling them up right now. Um, unless you want to wait for a pullback, you could either A, sell put spreads um, or B, throw on some call spreads right at the money. 315, 325 would be an area that I would uh, be comfortable in. Great. Well, John, really appreciate you coming back on the show. Um, definitely great to hear your insights and uh, uh, some great ideas uh, for even if it's not right now, but looks like some of these stocks have a good future uh, for us to look forward to. So thanks for being here. Of course. Thank you very much. Have a great one, Arusha. Great to be on with you and Justin again. Yeah, and no, I thanks, all my John. friends at IBD. <laughs> yeah. And of course, a lot of times you can see John Nigerian, not only on CNBC as a contributor, but he is a frequent guest on IBD Live. So make sure uh, you kind of check out IBD Live at investors.com slash IBD Live. Uh, you can kind of get a sense of who our guest list is and you will find John Nigerian on there uh, pretty regularly. So thanks for coming on the show uh, then as well. We always have a good time with you. Uh, and that's going to be wrapping it up for us today. Joining us on the show next week, we are going to have Dave Ellison. He's a portfolio portfolio manager at Hennessy Funds. So we'll be looking forward to that, especially getting his take on what might be an even more volatile market. So make sure you stay tuned for that. And thank you very much for joining us on this show. We'll see you next time. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.